So what I want to do today is try to give you something to take home and pray about in relation to your own action plans that you've been working on. And what I, as I thought about how I can approach this whole topic of the theology of women, which Pope Francis has asked us to think seriously about, as a philosopher, I thought, well, I need to look and see what theologians do when they do their work. What's the methodology? And what is clear is it's a combination of scripture and tradition. So I thought, what parts of scripture would relate to women's action plans? And then what part of tradition would relate to women's action plans? So for the tradition, I took the four documents that were written by the popes who made four women doctors of the church. And then I looked at the four areas of scripture, the first being uh, the principle of law in the Old Testament, the second being the prophets, the third being in the New Testament, the encounter with Jesus Christ, and then the fourth, the mission going forth to proclaim the good news, the gospel. And I could see that each one of those doctors of the church fit fairly well in one of those four categories. So what I'm going to do is briefly, I'll try to summarize it in a way um, that we can talk about it during the, I'll be here the next two days if you want to talk with me privately too, that's fine. We may have a little time at the end of this session um, for questions, but most of all that you can take it home. You have the scripture passages in the outline, you can pray yourself how it relates to your own specific action plan. And I also thought about my own life, you know. I had lots of action plans, and God had lots of different action plans. <laughs> and so there's that whole question of the relationship between my plan and God's plan, so. All right, so the Theology of Woman invites us to, to, to look at scripture from a particular aspect, and the tradition of the church from a particular aspect. What can we learn from the failures and successes of women whose lives have become part of the gift of the church to us in the sacred scriptures, and the same thing from the four female doctors of the church. St. Paul admonished us that the manifestation of the spirit is given to each of us for the profit of all. It's not given to us just for ourselves. Often it's given to us for someone else. So what are the strengths, weaknesses, temptations of our spiritual mothers who gave evidence in their own action plans? How did their action plans relate to divine action plans? And are they specific to a theology of woman or to a shared theology of all people, women and men? How can these insights help us to go forward to serve the Lord through our own action plans in the church? So that's the introduction. So we start with the first section on the law. There we start with Eve, the mother of all the living, who summarized the divine com command in Genesis you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. She knew the law and yet was so taken by the beauty of the tree in the center of the garden that she wanted to consume it for herself. She was willing to believe the lie of another that it was not against God's command to consume the tree. So, this is quote, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, who, and he ate. So by analogy, we can ask ourselves, even if my action plan appears good, is it in conformity with the law of God in every respect? Even if it leads to more knowledge, will this knowledge increase or decrease fidelity to God and the church? The last part of the passage from Genesis 3.6 is very instructive, specifically drawing out a consequence for women. Eve did not want to keep this desired fruit of wisdom to herself alone, she wanted to share it. She first took the forbidden fruit for herself, and then she gave some fruit to her husband, and he ate. St. Paul, John, John Paul II claimed that the effects of original sin have led women to have a propensity towards a specific temptation of the desire to possess the man, specific, or cling, possess or cling to the man. To the woman, he said, your desire shall be for your husband. The particular effect for man of original sin is that he shall want to rule over women, 
over others too, not just women. So the men particular effect of original sin is to want to dominate. Applying these insights from scripture, a woman could ask herself whether she desires to possess or cling to her action plan for herself and those closest to her rather than freely share it with others. The next example is Rachel, the wife of Jacob. She became the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. However, she um, unfortunately died in childbirth with Benjamin. And we aren't sure exactly what the reason is, whether it was because she stole the idols of her father, which were forbidden, that would be one thing, or whether she just um, lied when her father came looking, Laban came looking for the idols, she just said uh, she couldn't get up from the camel where she had them hidden because the way of woman was on her. Jacob, in the meantime, told um, Laban that if whoever has the idols will die, is what he said. So to make a long story short, she died in childbirth. So she didn't herself, she filled the position, she brought to birth um, Benjamin, who is the one who became a relative of David, and she was buried outside of, of uh, Bethlehem. So there is an example where a woman, in a certain way, having her own desires and situations, intervened a, a bit with inter, interfered with God's plan initially. But fortunately, it all came out all right. Now. The woman's labor, hard labor to bring forth a new child provides a perspective to all our action plans. The Lord's plan may bring his own action plan to a sudden, our plans to a sudden halt, as in the case of Rachel. She was buried on the way to Bethlehem. Later in scripture, uh, the divine law was developed into the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, it says specifically that the followers of the covenant should not worship other gods. The Lord, then the Lord is the I am who am. The name was revealed to Moses in the burning bush. So the eternal law of God is specified in the Ten Commandments. We could call it the GPS of the divine action plan. <laughs> so again, one goes, puts the GPS away at their own risk. <laughs> the next example to think about is Ruth. She's a Moabite woman. As a widow, as it was expected that she'd return to her own people. Instead, her plan was filled with determination to accompany her mother-in-law and to adopt the law and the ways of the Jewish covenant with God. And she said to her, to Naomi, she, Naomi said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you, for where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And so you can see, in, this is an example of someone who really was outside the line of the divine covenant at first, who freely chose to enter into it. And because of this, she then became um, the great-great-grandmother of David through whom the line goes to Jesus Christ. So we, the genealogy is very, very important for our own faith. Sometimes a divine action plan is situated within the eternal law, comes into conflict with a positive law. What I mean by positive law is law made by human beings. We see this in the case of Esther at first, because as you know, Mor Mordecai asked Queen Esther to intervene with her husband, the king, to plead for the safety of the Jewish people who were threatened with extinction by Haman. Queen Esther did not want to do it because it was risking her life. The king had said anyone who comes into his presence without his permission will be killed. So here's what Mordecai said to her, her uncle. Think not that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews, for if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will come from another direction, but you and your father's house will perish. Who knows whether you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this? So the, the divine action, Mordecai was telling Esther what the divine action plan was. And so she decided to break the law, but she asked everyone to fast and pray for three days before she did it. So she went forward and 
accepting what she didn't want to do by her own personal preference, and all things turned out well. You know, the, the king then got rid of him, and, and Mordecai was elevated, so and the Jewish people were saved. Now, to complete this first section on women in the law in the Old Testament, I look at Pope Emeritus Benedict's apostolic letter called A Light for Her People and Her Time, naming St. Hildegard of Bingen a doctor of the church. Here's what he described her, her work as. Her investigation develops from the biblical page in which in successive phase, phases it remains firmly anchored. So he continues, Hildegard asks herself and us the fundamental question, whether it's possible to know God. This is theology's principal task. Her answer is completely positive. Through faith as through a door, the human person is able to approach this knowledge. I can ask here, I can add here my own gratitude to St. Hildegard's extraordinary work on complementarity of woman and man. She's the first one to develop that theory. And that is in my first volume, if anyone's interested in that. <laughs> it's there. Um, the other thing about Hildegard is she was a scientist as well as a scripture scholar. She, she had ran the herb garden. I mean, she, she really had knowledge on all sorts of levels. She was extraordinary. St. Benedict's apostolic letter concludes, he asks, this attribution of the title of Doctor of the Universal Church to Hildegard of Bingen has great significance for today's world and an extraordinary importance for women. In Hildegard are expressed the most noble values of womanhood. Hence, the presence of women in the church and in society also illumined by her presence, both from the perspective of scientific research and that of pastoral activity. Her ability to speak of those who are far from the faith and from the church made Hildegard a credible witness of the new evangelization, unquote. So for those of you that have the opportunity to get to understand her work, it's very helpful. Most of the women doctors of the church are really in spiritual theology. She's the only one, except St. Catherine of Siena in another way, who is in another area, you know, like systematic and, and philosophical work. Okay, prophecy, second part. Scripture describes situations in which a person with the proper authority did not follow the appropriate steps for moving the divine action plan forward. In these situations, God often sent a prophet to lead the people back onto the line of the divine plan. Cardinal Ratzinger describes the purpose of a prophet. It's not a question of foretelling the future in detail, but of rendering the truth of God present at this moment in time and of pointing us in the right direction. So what he says is that God sends a prophet when people go offline. Um, so it's not just someone standing around telling them, <laughs> foreseeing the future. There's a mission involved. It's always a mission that a prophet has, is to bring people back onto the divine line. So if we look at the example of Rebecca, who's often maligned, I have to tell you, she's maligned by many people, but particularly I found by Protestant theologians who follow the philosopher Kant. Uh, they condemned her for maliciously manipulating her youngest son Jacob to rob her oldest son Esau from his rightful inheritance of a blessing from his father Isaac. Yet something deeper is actually occurring in the scriptural account than mere maternal manipulation for selfish purposes. Isaac was not only blind physically, but he was blind to the divine plan. He was about to give the blessing to Esau, who physically, who, I'm sorry, who had traded his birthright for a bowl of porridge and had taken wives who had worshipped idols. When Jacob was fearful about pretending to be Esau and the danger of being cursed rather than blessed by his father Isaac, Rebekah said, quote, Upon me be your curse, my son. Only obey my word and go and fetch them to me. So fetching the food that Isaac wanted. This is the earliest example in scripture of a woman or a man offering to take on herself the possible negative consequences of an act in order to free another person to follow the divine plan. St. John Chrysostom, in his 53rd homily on Genesis, says the following, What therefore, Rebecca? For she acted not only according to her own intention, but she serves the divine oracle and served, sought with all eagerness to free the boy from fears. The divine oracle was 
the oracle of the Lord that Rebecca went to when her twins were fighting inside her womb. And she was told that the older would serve the younger. So what he says is she knows that was the divine plan, but it was obviously not going to happen if Isaac went forward with his blessing of, I, of the other Esau. So she strengthened Jack, Jacob's soul that he might accomplish this stratagem. Nor did she promise him that he could mislead the father and hide it. She didn't say you won't be cursed or something. But what of this? Quote, upon me be the, your curse, my son. Only obey my word, and now go get them for me. So her courage stands out as a divinely inspired action to secure Jacob's place in the genealogy of David and Jesus Christ. The next example is Miriam, who is the sister of Moses and Aaron. She's described in scripture as a prophetess who took a timbrel in her hand, and all the wind went out after her with timbrels dancing, and Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord for his triumph gloriously, and the horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. This is an exodus. So Miriam starts off all right, but then in spite of this great moment, she defected before long. It took too long for Moses to come down. God wasn't doing his plan fast enough. And so she joined the others who gave their jewelry up to be melted and turned into the golden calf to be worshipped. So that's obviously a danger one needs to look at. If you get impatient, if you're, you think God's not helping you, you have to be sure to wait until it's the fullness of the time. Another example is Deborah, the prophetess, who, according to the book of Judges, was officially judging the people of Israel. At this time, the people of Israel cried to the Lord for help after being oppressed for 20 years by the king of Canaan and the commander of his army, Sisera. Deborah sent and summoned Barak and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from this tribe and from another tribe. And then she says, I will draw out Sisera and meet you there, and you will be successful. So in her case, her divine, the divine plan, as she saw it, contained not only its goal, but also the steps of how to accomplish it. But the commander Barak held back. He just said, I'll go if you go. So the cowardness of Barak was revealed when Deborah carefully integrated her action plan into the divine action plan until all was accomplished. You know, she said, okay, I'll go. If you're afraid, I'll go. But that wasn't what she'd asked. Our final example of prophets is Judith, who had developed an action plan after the leaders of Israel had put God to the test when they were completely surrounded by their enemies. Now, this putting God to the test is also an important way you can ruin your action plan. <laughs> and so this is, what, this is why Judith is very important. So the people there, Uzziah, the leader of his people, had tested God by saying he would surrender the city unless God came to their aid with water within five days. Okay, so Judith challenged him, who are you that have put God to the test this day and are setting yourself up in the place of God among the sons of men? So to make a long story short, Judith set the, her own, the motion, plan in motion, waited for God to reveal how it would be worked out step by step. And so the, I, you, the details you can read yourself, but that's, the important thing is to not put God to the test. <laughs> I think the particular saint uh, who is named as a doctor of the church, who's most related to this, is Saint Teresa of Jesus. She was the first doctor of the church, um, made doctor of church by Pope Paul VI in his text, The Manifold Wisdom of God. The Carmelite order had lost its original zeal for God, Christian prayer, and contemplative religious life. St. Teresa of Avila followed in the footsteps of the women prophets in the Old Testament who brought people back online with the divine plat action plan at the same time as she effected much needed reforms in religious life. Pope Paul VI describes her contribution. Quote, almost always suffering in body and full of tribulations, St. Teresa faced fearlessly any company for the glory of God and for the good of the church. We do not have to proclaim her doctor of the church with any doubt, but we do, especially because she's the first among women, especially in her knowledge and doctrine of divine things. St. Teresa became a master interpreter of spiritual discernment and authentic spiritual life. Pope Paul VI elaborated on her significance for the development of theology. She was able to understand, to teach, and to write by inspiration of God on very many deep subjects, 
considering Christ the only source of her doctrine and almost a living book. Regarding this, we must consider one thing above all that's wonderful, that St. Teresa has penetrated into the mystery of Christ and in the knowledge of the human soul with so much acuteness and sagacity that her doctrine clearly indicates the certain presence and strength of the singular charism of the Holy Spirit. Her teaching was important not only for the life of the faithful, but also, and most importantly, <clears throat> in working order for that section of choice and great value of theological knowledge, which is now called spiritual theology. Part three, the encounter with Jesus Christ. When we come to the women of the New Testament, everything begins with Mary of Nazareth. And her first encounter is a paradigm for discovering how God's action plan can transform one's own action plan. And I think you know this, you're so familiar with this, I don't need to go into the details, but what John Paul II calls the Annunciation Dialogue, her action plan was to be with Joseph and live an ordinary family life. And then God comes and, and so gives a different action plan. And he, she says, how can this be? She asks a question. She engages intelligently in it. He answers, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child be born, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Then Mary makes her act of will to receive this gift of God. Let it be to me according to your word. So the paradigm here is that Mary listens to what God says, doesn't understand, gauges her intellect, asks a question, hears the answer, and then makes an act of will to follow the divine plan, not her own plan. So that's a perfect example of the steps that are involved in this. St. John Paul II elaborates on this moment in a key way that brings out the element of the theology of woman. Thus, the fullness of time manifests the extraordinary dignity of woman. On the one hand, this dignity consists in supernatural elevation to union with God in Jesus Christ, which determines the ultimate finality of the existence of every person, both on earth and in eternity. So from this point of view, the woman is representative and archetype of the whole human race. On the other hand, the event at Nazareth highlights a form of union with the living God which can only belong to the woman, Mary, the union between mother and son. The Virgin of Nazareth truly becomes the mother of God. So the mother of Redeemer has a precise place in the plan of salvation, according to John Paul II's encyclical Redemptoris Mater. Each one of us also has a precise plan in the plan of salvation. That's important to remember, each one of us. St. Edith Stein expressed this truth in her work, Finite and Eternal Being, when she describes how each of us, quote, steps into existence, unquote, with a pure form in God's mind of his divine plan for our life. Yet the divine plan is not imposed on us without cooperation of our free will. So we're challenged throughout life to make our own plans commensurate with the plan of God. And the way we learn how to do this is through prayer, thinking about our goals, listening to suggestions by wise and holy men and women, and making a decision, and then evaluating that. Now, pondering the life of Mary of Nazareth leads us to many surprises. She had willingly to adjust her specific plans to accord with a divine plan for herself many times. Just consider her travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem when nine months pregnant, her flight into Egypt when so many innocent children were murdered because of her son, her unexpected life as a refugee in a foreign country when Herod was looking to kill her son, her three days search for Jesus in Jerusalem when he was lost from their caravan, her initiative with Jesus in Cana when he did not think that the time for his public signs had come, her presence at the foot of the cross as her son was dying, and her central place with the apostles and the prayers in the upper room with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Many, many examples of where the divine plan obviously was different from what she was expecting. So each one of us needs to recognize that, quote, the Holy Spirit's life-giving action transforms our own plans in ways that continue to build up the church. Now, the other thing is it's important to have your own action plan. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have one. You need to, to, to do the best with your mind and will and experience and start something. If you just sit back and wait for the action plan to come, it probably won't. 
So it's that interesting combination of your own human work, then pre you know, presenting it, but being willing to modify it when God asks. Now Mary, the mother of God, what we call recapitulates the gifts of the laws and the prophets, meaning that she relives them in herself in new ways. And I think myself, personally, after her assumption into heaven, Mary continues her works of guidance in specifically Guadalupe, La Salette, Lourdes, and Fatima. She's appeared. You know, that seems to be what, where God sends her, is when things are going wrong somewhere. You know, she, Mary is sent as a prophet um, to help lead to the next step of life on the divine line. So just something again to ponder. Now, when other women in the gospel encountered Jesus Christ, they were completely transformed. Um, they, John Paul II says, the women who are close to Christ discover themselves in the truth which he teaches and does, even when this truth concerns their sinfulness. They feel liberated by this truth, restored to themselves. They feel loved with eternal love, with a love which finds direct expression in Christ himself. In Christ's sphere of action, their position is transformed. Consider the Samaritan woman who's five, had five women in conversation with Jesus at the will. The woman speaks truthfully to him when she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who's called the Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Then Martha, the sister of Lazarus, Jesus revealed his future resurrection and all its gifts to all who believe. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, he asks her. She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. After Jesus' death and resurrection, he encountered Mary Magdalene. It says, go to my brethren. And say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He gave her a mission. Well, that's another thing that um, Pope Benedict wrote beautifully about when he was Cardinal Ratzinger. He was pondering why, after Jesus died and he began to appear to the disciples, he didn't just appear to everybody. Why? And his, what his answer is, that he seems to only appear when he has a mission to give to someone who's willing to receive it. So the people on the way to Emmaus, uh, Mary Magdalene, this is a case here, Mary Magdalene, she was there waiting and ready to receive the mission. She was given a mission. So Mary Magdalene went to said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told him all these things that, to her. They didn't believe her, but so then he got, came to them. <laughs> and told them that they should have believed it. So um, we have to think about this in our own selves. Are we always available to the Lord for a, a, a new mission, something unexpected? Now, uh, on October 19, 1997, St. Therese of Lisieux was named Doctor of the Church by Pope John Paul II. His apostolic letter, Nation shall come to your light. Here's what he says. In her experience, Christ is the center and fullness of revelation. Therese knew Jesus, loved him, and made him love with the passion of a bride. She penetrated the mysteries of his infancy, the words of his gospel, the passion of the suffering servant engraved on his holy face, in the splendor of his glorious life, and in his Eucharistic presence. He says, her writings emphasize the scriptures. They contain over 1,000 biblical quotations more than 400 from the Old Testament and 600 from the New. Paul, Pope John Paul II summarized her gift to the church, quote, thus we can rightly recognize in the Saint of Lisieux the charism of the doctor of the church because of the gift of the Holy Spirit she received for living and expressing her experience of faith and because of her particular understanding of the mystery of Christ. Final part, apostolic service. Women leaders go forth. <laughs> Following the ascension, the apostles were in the upper room in Jerusalem, and all of these, in, with one accord, devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. In most images, we just see Mary there, but it says, this Acts say, together with Mary and the women. So there were others there. 
And thus, according to Luke Acts, women prayed together with the men in the first community in Jerusalem. After Judas was replaced by Matthias to complete the 12 apostles, the Holy Spirit was poured forth into this growing community of women and men. When the day of Pentecost came, had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is from Acts. So the Holy Spirit resting on each one of them will now accompany the works of women who together with men build up the church. This period marks the model of collaboration among men who are apostles and women who are disciples, which began during Jesus' lifetime. And again, as I say, you just really only see the apostles with the flames, even in the <laughs> no other flames. So they were there, they just have been invisible in the history of the church in a certain way. <laughs> okay, after Paul and Barnabas became Christians, one of the women who met them in Philippi was called Lydia, a seller of purple goods. She was a worshiper of God and was baptized with her household. Then Lydia said to them, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. The author of Acts follows with the words, and she prevailed upon us. So here we have an example of this dialogue between the apostles and women where an offer was made and, and the apostles accepted it. So it's a beautiful example. In Athens at the Areopagus, Paul was talking to the philosophers and, relig and religious intellectuals there, trying to persuade them that God was not made of silver or gold, but rather gave life and breath, and made from one nation of men, made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth. Now, although most of his listeners turned away at this message, some joined him and believed, among them, quote, a woman named Damaris. So here we have a woman at the Areopagus with the philosophers. So for those of you in professional work, it's, it's just helpful to see. And, and Lydia was a, a businesswoman. She was a seller of purple goods, very wealthy. So these are professional women who, right from the beginning, were part of the apostolic mission of the church. Another woman named Priscilla, with her husband Aquila, were in the profession of tent making. They had been expelled from Italy by Claudius, who commanded that all the Jews leave Rome. Paul, quote, went to see them in Corinth because he was made of the same because he was of the same trade, and he stayed with them working together, for by trade they were tent makers. Again, Paul refers to them in Romans 16, three to four. Quote, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life. They didn't just make tents together, they really sacrificed dangerously their own lives. In the same letter, he also refers to, quote, our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at Senecre that you may receive her as the Lord, in the Lord as befits the saints, and help her with whatever she may require for you. Before, for she has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Now you may know that the question of what it, she did as a deaconess is a big question mark, but the church has been asked to look into that if there's any more evidence, we just don't know. The one thing I heard from Mother Timothea, who's our scripture scholar, for whatever it's worth to you, is that she said that the deaconesses, from her knowledge, were women who helped the women who were being baptized go down into the water, you know, which is like Lourdes. If you go to Lourdes, there are women that help the women and men help the women, men. So I don't know. Some people are hoping there's more to it than that, but it's an open question. The church will decide and let them do that. <laughs> okay, our final example comes from the 12th book of Revelations, which provides a spiritual context for, I think, all the theology of women. The evangelist John describes the monumental battle between the evil dragon and the woman who gives birth. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman, she was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth in anguish for delivery. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon who stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, that he might devour her child when she brought it forth. We know how many child, children are devoured by evil before they're brought forth these days in the United States and around the world. St. John Paul II refi reflects on this message in section 30 of Moliere's Dintatem, entitled Awareness of a Mission. 
His words are prophetically important, I think, for you as you go forth to implement your own action plans. We can see that the struggle with evil and the evil one marks the biblical exemplar of the woman from the beginning to the end of history. <laughs> Is not the Bible trying to tell us that it's precisely the woman, Eve Mary, that history witnesses a dramatic struggle for every human being? The struggle for his or her fundamental yes or no to God and God's eternal plan for humanity. In this context, St. John Paul II identifies important starting points for the theology of women. And this is a quote. The moral and spiritual strength of woman is joined to her awareness that God entrusts the human being to her in a special way. Of course, God entrusts every human being to each and every other human being. But this entrusting concerns women in a special way, precisely by reason of their femininity, and this, in a particular way, determines their vocation. The moral force of women, which draws strength from this awareness, thank you, and this entrusting, expresses itself in a great number of figures of the Old Testament of the time of Christ and the later ages up to our day. The fourth woman doctor is St. Catherine of Siena, and <laughs> who was made in 1970 in the apostolic letter, The Lord is Wonderful in His Church, by Pope Paul VI, a doctor of the church. And here's what he says. Growing daily in virtue, summoned and drawn by a vision of God in the year 1370, Catherine entered upon a ministry which is truly and properly called an apostolic ministry, even though at that time no such ministry was open to women." Unquote. So St. Catherine, a member of the Third Order of Lay Dominicans, is well known for convincing Pope Gregory XI to return the papacy to Rome after it had moved to Avignon, France. She also resolved conflicts between different political factions in Italy and courageously cared for the sick. And you know about her life, likely. Um, here's other words of Paul VI. Her brilliant light gradually shone more and more brightly and it radiated far beyond her own city and region, since her counsels were sought by more and more, and her very numerous letters were sent to all sorts of persons. These letters display the ardor and desire of her spirit burning with love. They demonstrate her pure faith and the solidity of her principles, her gravity of speech, the prudence of her judgments, and the subtlety of her opinions in theological matters." Unquote. So a brief conclusion. What have we learned from about the theology of women from this consideration? First, that we always need to have our prime focus on the divine plan rather than on our own action plan, and to not make an idol of our own action plan. Second, as women we have temptations to face that original sin makes us more disposed than men to fall into, which is to want to cling or possess what is close to us. Third, as women, we have wonderful models in scripture who remain always faithful to the divine plan, integrating their own plans into the divine plan for the good of others, and collaborating with ordained and laymen in the church to bring about the completion of this plan. Fourth, as human beings, we realize that temptations are a normal part of Christian life of women and men. Jesus experienced them and demonstrated to us how to overcome them. Cardinal Ratzinger offers a beautiful summary of this fact. Quote, thus the temptation story summarizes the entire struggle of Jesus. It is about the nature of his mission, but at the same time it is also in general about the right ordering of human life, about the way to be human, about the way of history. Finally, it's about what is really important. This ultimate thing, this decisive thing, is the primacy of God. The germ of all temptation is setting God aside so that he seems to be secondary concern when compared with all the urgent priorities of our lives. To consider ourselves, the needs and desires of the moment to be more important than he is, that is the temptation that always besets us. For in doing so, we deny God his divinity and we make ourselves, or rather the powers that threaten us, into our God. So, in conclusion, the women in the Old and New Testaments and the female doctors of the church tried to avoid putting God to the test, tried to persevere when things seemed to take too much time, tried to remain faithful to the divine commandments, 
tried to be willing to go forward prophetically when others seemed to turn away from the divine plan, and tried to love Jesus Christ and to rejoice in the Holy Spirit as he leads us through dying and rising in Christ to leave integrally our own place in the divine action for the salvation of the world. Thank you.